Okay, hello everyone. My name is Sadie Redigal. I'm a research associate here at the National Congress of American Indians. I wanted to do to welcome, I wanted to welcome you all to our introductory in webinar for our Farm Bill Policy Brief. Um, just to get us started, I will start on a um, housekeeping slide. So today for the webinar, we'll be utilizing the chat box function. Please submit all questions to the chat box function. If your question is for a specific panelist, please identify the presenter when you submit your question, or if you wanna give a question to the overall group, just say for all presenters. Our Q&A portion will be after all presentations are given. Uh, please note that NCI staff will queue questions as they are received, so you can submit anytime throughout the webinar. If you have any follow-up thoughts about today's webinar, that you didn't get to today, um, please be sure to email NCI staff at foodsovereignty at nci.org. And with that, I will pass on over to today's moderator, Marlene Wakefield. Marlene, take it away. Thank you, Sadie. Um, good afternoon to everyone out there. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during this time. Um, I wanna let you all know that yes, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date. Um, as Sadie indicated, my name is Marlene Wakefield. I'm an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation here in Western New York, proud member of the Turtle Clan, the largest clan of the Senecas. Um, I am a nurse by trade, uh, but I went and got my doctorate. I'm working on it right now. Um, I'm ABD, so I'm happy about that. But I also wanted to share with you that I did start the Seneca Nation's food sovereignty program called Food is Our Medicine, Healthy First Nations. Um, I was on, involved on the board for that. So we have been working at this for a decade now. And we started with a little bit of white corn and we now have bison. Um, so I'm really excited to be working in this space. Next slide, please. The Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative at NCAI is part of the Tribal Governance Department. We have had uh, involved in some activities since 2018. We held some symposiums this year and we all had to adapt and switch to the virtual environment because of COVID. Um, we have five case studies. We have another one coming out shortly, so stay, stay tuned for that. Um, we have a resource directory that will be launching next month, January 14th of 2021, so stay tuned for information on that as well. And we also will be creating an interactive online resource center. Next slide. Today, we're here to talk about the Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill and the brief's purpose. Um, this brief is to provide a cursory assessment of the state of implementation of the landmark tribal provisions contained in the 2018 Farm Bill to share Indian country's policy recommendations for Congress and the administration about how to strengthen the implementation of these provisions and how, how are we uh, setting the table for 2023, setting forth the initial list of Indian country's overarching policy priorities for the 2023 Farm Bill, which can and will be expanded upon. Next slide. I'd like to introduce our first three speakers. Uh, we have Zach Deschanel, Executive Director, Intertribal Ag Agriculture Council. We have Colby Duran, Director of Policy and Government Relations, the Intertribal Ag Culture, uh, Council, excuse me. And we want to especially congratulate Erin on her new appointment as Permanent Director of the Indigenous Food and Agricultural Initiative. We'll give her a silent round of applause. Um, without further ado, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, everybody, and good afternoon or evening or morning, where, whatever it might be, whenever you get a chance to watch this. Uh, I'm Zach Dushno, Executive Director of the IAC. For those of you that don't know, we are a nonprofit established in 1987 to promote the unified effort to develop and conserve our natural resources for our own purposes. And when we get a chance to talk about the farm bill and implementation and, and recommendations, I always like to rewind back to when we first started in this effort. I think the first farm bill that we worked on was in 1992. 
And prior to that, if you look back to the 86 farm bill, Indians and tribes were mentioned less than 10 times throughout the entire 1100 page document. The IAC partnered with our other national organizations to start to rectify that shortly after we were formed. One of the first things that we look to do is empower tribal nations to be able to control their natural resources and pass, the, pass and promulgate the laws under which the BIA even administers uh, or delivers their services in Indian country. So in 19, you know, it became apparent that a standalone piece of legislation was gonna be needed for that. So in 93, we were able to get the American Indian Ag Resources Management Act passed by Congress in order to empower tribes to do that. To this day, we have yet to have a tribe fully adopt an ag resource management plan and fully implement that tribal authority. So there's a, the reason I bring that up is there's a continuum to these things that we have to maintain and see to and, and nurture almost in order to bring them to fruition. So the initiatives that were highlighted as the successes of the 2018 Farm Bill were things that we didn't quite get to as a nationwide coalition of uh, similarly aligned organizations in advocating for things in the 2012 Farm Bill, which happened in 2014. And those 2012 and 14 recommendations came forward from 2008, et cetera, et cetera. So while we did make significant ground because of the resource that was that we were able to commit to this effort in 2018, there's still a lot of work to be done. And one of the things I've been fond of saying as we have these meetings all across the country, talking about the run up to the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, patting ourselves on the back for having such success once it was finally passed and signed into law, we should really be looking about looking at the 2030 or 2034 Farm Bill for where we want to be as Indian country agriculture and food systems at that point in time and how we want to use the opportunities to educate policymakers about that vision and bring those to pass in the interim. So I don't know what we've got for a next slide here, but I feel like I've uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Native Farm Bill Coalition and how we were able to muster those resources. We got into some conversations very early on with the Shakopee Metawakton Sioux community, our brothers and sisters over there in South Central Minnesota, as part of their Seeds of Native Health campaign. And it's follow up to work of the Seeds of Native Health campaign that created the Regaining Our Future report, which really laid out a clear plan for a section by section analysis of what could be done in Indian country if we had the ear of the policymakers. And that caught the attention of our friends at SMSC and they put forward a quarter million dollars to fund this farm bill effort and stood up the native farm bill coalition. They also threw a challenge out there to other organizations to match, uh, match that on a dollar for dollar basis. I don't know if we were ever able to recruit anybody, but that being said, the $250,000 that was spent to move tribal leadership to DC to advocate on our behalf, to bring tribal youth from all across the country to NCAI in Milwaukee to kick off the effort, really resonated and was very impactful. And by virtue of that effort, the Native Farm Bill Coalition continued after 2018. And when the Native American Ag Fund rolled out its policy initiative just last year, the IAC applied to stand up and 
sort of take on the challenge of maintaining this discussion about the farm bill on an ongoing basis. So we will be able to resource this at that same level or more for the next three years through the 2023 farm bill. And we're gonna to continue to raise funds to do that, looking at that 2030 or 2034 farm bill. The goal is really to move Indian country to self-sufficiency and sovereignty through economic development that is empowered by rebuilding our food systems. Now there are 20, 63 tribal specific provisions in that farm bill and you see them there in front of you so I won't read it to you but really what the idea was as we engaged in these things. Well, let me rewind first. We were told very early on in the discussion by the policymakers and the staff on the Hill, your recommendations have to come at no cost and we will not create new programs. So in spite of those very narrow guardrails, we still got 63 provisions into that farm bill. Many of them moving a long ways towards the tribal management of many of the nutrition programs, the forest programs and the like. And this is where I'll hand it off to Colby to talk more in detail about those tribal specific provisions and welcome any conversations or questions after the fact. And I'm sure you all will get my contact information uh, at the end of this presentation. So Colby, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Zach. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Colby Dern. I'm the Director of Policy and Government Relations for the IAC. Um, just talking about some of the implementation of the travel specific provisions of the farm bill and i'll also I think as we go in here call on our our, our friend our, uh, aaron at uh, ifai as well too so there were two pretty big provisions in the farm bill that focused on putting uh, tribal self-governance at usda for the very first time in both um the forestry programs which is a pilot project that allows Tribal, uh, tribal governments to manage adjacent federal forest service lands under 638 contract agreements. And the first ones of those have been have been signed uh, so far. And then also extending that to the food distribution program on Indian reservations as well too. Um, there were, um, if you actually could go back a slide, uh, we can just talk about kind of what was in it just from a high level thing. Thank you. Um, so there, there are also additional conservation uh, parity priorities. One thing we do want to highlight as something that you know we'll talk about implementation of is the alternative funding arrangement. This is essentially allowing tribal governments to be able to enter into uh, arrangements to provide funding for conservation programs like EQIP and CSP to their tribal producers and to help uh, the implementation of those practices and funding on the ground. Um, there's also a uh, rural uh, development tribal technical assistance office um, and a, uh, some specific components regarding tribal broadband priority. You know, rural development has such a strong mm -hmm. ability to be able to help build out infrastructure, uh, help support food system development in Indian country and throughout rural America as well. So having an office like that to support our friends at, at RD who are trying to deploy that is, is critically important. Um, there's also parity for um, tribal colleges and universities throughout as well, um, looking at uh, access to different scholarship programs, uh, including having both tribal colleges, universities and uh, state land grant institutions having a native scholarship program as well, and, and those have gone out. Um, and then I'm sure most folks are familiar with the legalization of, of hemp and also the inclusion of tribal regulation of that. So all of the 63 provisions are through 11 of the 12 titles of the Farm Bill. Uh, the only one that doesn't have one, uh, just out of full disclosure, is, uh, the, is the energy title. And that was because this time around, it was just paper thin. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit specifically about some of the implementation of it. And yeah. I think I might uh, pass it off to um, Aaron to talk about the, uh, the FDIPR implementation of the 638 pilot. Absolutely. Thank you, Colby. And thank you, Zach. Um, and thanks to everybody at NCAI for hosting this this afternoon and letting us talk a little bit about the exciting opportunities for Indian country policy in the 2023 Farm Bill. Um, I'm going to give just a little bit of a rundown of some of the FDIPR provisions. Um, I think that 
the biggest change in the 2018 farm bill that we saw that we're still kind of waiting on implementation for unquestionably is going to be that 638 authority for um, the FDIPR food procurement. This is the first time this authority has ever applied to USDA and what this demonstration project will do is acknowledge tribal sovereignty by enabling tribal nations and Indian tribal organizations or ITOs to source food directly for this package. So rather than having USDA or the federal government be in the role of selecting which foods are best for a tribal community, the tribal nation will be doing that decision making and doing that food procurement. So really a strong acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty through that particular provision is really exciting. The farm bill, just so you know, high level overview put really limited requirements directly on that package. There are really only three that we see in section 4003B of the farm bill. And that's a requirement that foods procured by tribes for this be domestically sourced, which is exactly the same as you would see in the USDA food package. Um, foods for this provision also need to basically swap out a food that's already in the package. So tribal nations will be able to choose a food that's in the food package that's being offered to their community right now that maybe isn't as popular, something they want to replace with something that they are sourcing on their own from vendors that they identify. Um, and then the third is that uh, the foods for this have to be the nutritional equivalent or higher for foods in the food package currently. We're seeing a lot of interest around Indian country from tribal nations in procuring food under this provision. A lot of tribes are really looking at ways to include more traditional foods using this provision. So I think that nutritional equivalent standard will be um, a fairly easy one to meet, especially for folks who are doing that, that traditional food sourcing. Tribal leaders have really been working with USDA even before the farm bill was passed talking about the need for more acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty through authorities like 638 for FDIPR. And I think what this will do um, ultimately once it's once it's out is, is, is acknowledge tribal sovereignty in this process. Congress did appropriate $3 million for this and that fund must be spent out by the end of the fiscal year in 21. So 9-30, uh, 2021. But um, tribes will have longer to spend it past that date. Just the funds have to leave USDA by the end of um, September of 2021. Um, Aaron, we're still waiting. Yeah. Before we get too far away from the nutrition component of this, I think one of the things yeah. that's important for the viewing audience to really drive home any chance you have a chance to talk with a policymaker is the food and nutrition programs, while they are a humongous section of the farm bill spending, are not simply about food and nutrition. They are about price support for American grown commodities. And too often we get pitted against each other, the ag producers and the consumers or the, or the recipients of these programs because the farmers and ranchers don't see their portion of the farm bill as help but they see the food and nutrition programs as welfare. And we've got to start to remind everybody that we are required to buy domestically sourced products with those programs. So it is price support for existing production and commodities. Uh, that's absolutely correct, Zach, when we're talking about those commodity assistance programs at USDA. And that's not just for FDIPR, that's also for programs like the Community Supplemental Food Program or CSFP for the Emergency Food Assistance Program or TFAP. Any of those commodity assistance programs from USDA, all of that is domestically sourced food that comes through USDA. It really is a huge market channel opportunity for producers. And along with some of the other changes that came out for FDIPR in the 2018 Farm Bill, one of which was the requirement that USDA where practicable, that's the language in the law, sourced not only local but also regional foods for FDIPR specifically. It's a really strong opportunity, um, not only to get better, healthier, culturally appropriate food to FDIPR participants, but to also do some economic empowerment of native producers by sourcing food directly from tribal producers for these programs. So that's one of the other changes that, that happened. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. So definitely headed in that direction. It's good to have that conversation with everybody. Um, but that is, that's another change that got made in the 2018 Farm Bill. And I would just like to note too, just, just so you know, for where all these, uh, these provisions really came from was from tribal leaders and the National Association of Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations Board. Um, without those folks really tirelessly advocating for changes to FDIPR that improve service to FDIPR participants and make life easier for the hardworking folks 
at Indian tribal organizations across the country who run FDIP every single day on the ground. We wouldn't really have had these priorities identified and ultimately, I think, implemented into um, the legislation and the farm bills. We're still working. I know this is an implementation thing. So you can see on the screen here, there's a link to our um, IFAI 2018 Farm Bill Implementation Tracker that contains not only the provisions that I just talked about for FDEPR, but also the provisions Colby just mentioned about alternative funding arrangements, the forestry provisions, broadband. We really looked at every single provision. All of those 63 tribal specific provisions we're tracking in that document, and that'll be updated as changes are made. So please check it out. Um, and you can reach out to us anytime. But I think that's my FDEPR update mostly. So Colby, I'll pass it back over to you and Zach. No, thanks, Aaron. And definitely check out the implementation tracker uh, to see where the latest state of things are as uh, things are continuing to be uh, implemented. Um, just to be talked about alternative funding arrangements, um, you know, one of the broadband uh, um, components we also want to talk about is, you know, there uh, there were tribal priority points included in the first rollout of the broadband program. When the reconnect, there wasn't in the second one. So when that program continues to go, ensuring that there is tribal priority and inclusion in those programs are essential to really help address the digital divide in Indian country. Um, <clears throat> another provision that is hasn't been implemented yet is that there was uh, included in the bill a tribal advisory committee which is really meant to help support and advise the secretary directly on policy initiatives um, that need to occur throughout the department and also across agency issues as well too, including uh, the Department of the Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. And so that hasn't uh, been implemented yet. That was actually included in a signing statement um, done when the bill was signed into law saying that it was unconstitutional um, there is, an, a, a, for folks that are familiar with the Treasury, the Tribal Treasury Advisory Committee, it is structured exactly like that. And that committee we know is doing incredible work with the Department of Treasury advocating for changes and, and working through those programs. So being able to institute that as soon as possible is going to be important to not only solicit what's going on uh, historically, but also what's occurring right now through the pandemic and what can be done using USDA's flexibilities and authorities to help address some of the different issues. And so with that, if we could go to the next slide. Um, so we're kind of talking about a little bit of the transition and it's important for this as we want to make sure that the provisions that are currently um, being implemented or not been implemented are, aren't getting lost uh, in the shuffle. So the agency review teams are, are, are going through those as well. So you know, we would definitely recommend folks that are, are reaching out and talking to that to highlight the particular provisions that aren't that, that need to continue to be implemented as well too. And some of the things that you know, we've been looking at and talking about, you know, not knowing uh, what the layout of Congress might look at with two outstanding Senate, Senate races occurring. Um, what are some administrative actions that um, when this administration walks into the door on day one and also by day 100 can accomplish. So what is that potential sort of legislative, um, or what, what are those things that can be done without legislation? Um, you know, those are the different directives that can come from the secretary, that can come from executive orders, that can come from presidential memoranda as well to, to offer a little bit more flexibility from, um, from, from that perspective, and also agency guidance. Um, additionally, even though we're, we're going into uh, maybe a couple more days of an extended funding package, um, but also looking to fund the the, uh, the the federal government for the next fiscal year. You know, uh, this uh, administration is going to come in and make funding recommendations. So, what does that look like? Ensuring Predipper gets the full five million, if not more, funding, well, to ensure as many programs that get into that as well too. The funding that needs to happen to make some of the implementation occur of some of the other programs, as well, and how do we best be able to help support that? I don't know if, if Aaron or Zach want to talk a little bit about some of the transition. Yeah, and I think it's important uh, to focus on the things that <clears throat> are readily there for implementation. Uh, we've got to get that FDIPR money out the door. We're not going to be able to prove what we can do unless that pilot program really starts to take off. So that's really one of the one of the key aspects of, of our, the IAC's transition brief. But there are other things that, that are also included in, in this brief that, that really resonate. Elevating the Office of Tribal Relations within the depart department to have more authority to implement 
and to exercise that authority across the department. The uh, knowledge that OTR brings to the issues that are raised <clears throat> can really help provide a shortcut to meaningful policy change. Uh, senior advisor in tribal affairs within rural development, heck, let's go one better. Let's appoint an Indian to run rural development. Then they're by definition a senior advisor. One of the things that we're really hoping to see and that we've put out a, a call for is support for Janie Sims Hip as the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, because then we would get that knowledge of Indian country that spans all the way across the department. And if you get a chance to let folks know how important it is to have our, our people placed highly within the department, it's long past time for that to start to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've also got some recommendations for Congress that could be implemented before the Farm Bill happens. And as part of any ongoing CARES Act or coronavirus uh, issues that are raised. And if, if there are any questions about that, we can bring those to the conversation here after we wrap up the, the Farm Bill brief. Yeah. And I think I would I would just echo Zach's comments, especially about the FIDIPR 638 implementation. Like that, that money absolutely has to be spent. Um, tribal leaders have spent some time in consultation talking to USDA on multiple occasions about the draft criteria that they had developed for that program as it rolled out. The last round of draft criteria we saw came out in October, and it really did respond to a lot of the the concerns that tribal leaders had had about the first draft, which was released earlier this year in uh, in the summer. Um, so really, we're just kind of playing a waiting game and waiting for USDA to open up that process. I think it will be successful as soon as they open the door. And I think I say this on every webinar that I'm on lately, but I check every single day in the Federal Register is one of the first things I do every day with my coffee. I open it up and see if that, that document has dropped yet. And unfortunately, it hasn't. I check again, right before this. Um, so that is as current as I can make it um, for information updates there, but they really do need to open up that process because there is a, an opportunity in future appropriation cycles to get more funds, as Colby was mentioning, like that's a request that could be included in future president's budgets to fund that at the full 5 million or even more that the Farm Bill authorized. Um, but that's not gonna happen if that money doesn't get spent. Um, the, so that's that's the really the big number one, I think administrative action um, out of this set of recommendations in addition to the other things that Zach highlighted like elevating the Office of Tribal Relations again, um, the signatory authority that that office had was huge and really critical. So I would point those two things out for sure. And I think it's important to note that if we had higher placed Indian leadership in the department that FDIPR program would be out the door already and we'd be eating our own food at our FDIPR sites. It's strictly reluctant, reluctance on the part of FNS to be proactive about implementing that. Their position was until there's an appropriation that goes with that authorization, we're not even gonna talk about how to implement it. And they could have been proactive and ahead of the game so that the day the appropriation passed, the program was ready to roll out, but it was stalled for months while we waited for an appropriation. Yeah, and I think that that also, that really does speak to the, the need not only for that senior leadership, but also for more Native people to be involved in career staffing levels at the department as well. A lot of the barrier has been just not understanding 638 as it applies to USDA because it's never applied to them before. Um, so having people who are already inside the building with that knowledge in senior leadership positions, but also career staff positions going forward, I think would be really critical. It really would have given everybody a leg up, I think, if there had already been that knowledge inside the department. So that's that's part of what we're waiting on as well. But that's I know that's another priority that's on the brief and another priority you had mentioned, just making sure that um, we're seeing American Indian Alaska Native folks actually working for the federal government within USDA too. And even addressing some of that, I think we've seen um, some of the um, 
uh, roll out that uh, USDA has done um, for this. For example, the farm, the, the families to farmer or farmers to families food box program is really structured like the FDIPA program. If it included the um, the ability that tribal leaders have been asking for for a long time to do the localized direct purchasing. And so what could have been done utilizing that infrastructure that was already there to help get food out, to help provide a, a, a place for producers to sell their food when lost their markets as well too. And so I, I know, uh, you know we, I think we probably need to move till the next thing of maybe what the, the next farm bill might look like in 2023. Um, some of the things that can be done administratively, we've, we've definitely talked about localized purchasing uh, principal deferral of payments across all the federal uh, borrowing as well too, um, and uh, seating the advisory committee, looking at climate change solutions across all of USDA's mission areas as well. Um, I don't know if, if folks wanted to jump in, if Zach or Aaron want to jump in on any of these sort of what can be done kind of quickly administratively on principal deferment payments for others. I think the deferral of principal payments to all federal borrowers, whether that be farm loan programs, rural development, Rural utilities, SBA, EDA, student loans. We can use that as an opportunity as to deploy a no cost stimulus package out there to the communities that need it the most. The, the individuals will still pay their interest so that we preserve the relationship with the taxpayer. But the principal payment that would have been due is just pushed off for a couple of years so we can all recover from the reality that we're that we're experiencing in this new COVID-19 era. So that, that's a critical part. Uh, localized purchasing F for Dipper, you know, we've talked about that. A MOU that is really meaningful between the Department of Interior and the Department of Agriculture and any other of the departments that are responsible for doing things in Indian country. HUD comes to mind, uh, HHS comes to mind. But those, those MOUs actually have to have some transfer of resources as well because it doesn't do any good for the Department of Interior and the Department of Agriculture to engage in an MOU with respect to conservation practices when the Department of Agriculture has all the conservation money and the Department of Interior has precious little. We're missing an opportunity there to capitalize on location and share funding across that trust responsibility within the government. Seating that tribal advisory committee, is absolutely critical because then we bring that government wide perspective to solutions in Indian country that relate to economic development opportunities through agriculture. And last, certainly not least climate change solutions until we find a way to leverage some of the capital that already exists in the ag and food system sector, loose from the, ex from the extractive forces, we're gonna continue to struggle to really move our tribal producers and farmers and ranchers and producers all across the country towards climate change solutions. So we've really gotta focus on that administratively. <clears throat> Is there a next slide? I'll let Colby talk a little bit about the political aspect as he's our government relations fella. I know we have a lot going on. I, I, know, uh, I, know, I know we have uh, uh, Fatima on as well too. So I wanted to oh, yes. um, sorry, invite, Fatima. Her into, yeah, invite her into the, in the chat as well to talk about, uh, obviously the work starts now. I think we always said the work started on the 2023 Farm Bill before the ink was dry in the 2018 one. Uh, so Fatima just wanted to hand it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Colby, and thank you all for this great discussion. I was taking a lot of notes. Um, as Colby mentioned, my name is Fatima Abbas, and I currently serve as a Vice President of Government Relations at NCAI. And um, for this section, I'm just going to briefly provide an overview of the policy brief section on the 2023 Farm Bill. The priorities that are in that policy brief are subject to further enhancement, but they've been based on tribal nation and tribal organization feedback. Next slide. Oh, actually, I already have the next slide. Um, you go back to the overview slide. 
Uh, so I'm just going to, for ease of reference, uh, go over a few of the provisions that are divided into rural development, forestry, education, and then nutrition and food sovereignty. Next slide. Rural development. So rural development uh, is a bulk of um, perspective provisions that are being looked at, and I'm going to go through and uh, just highlight a few. So regarding the first bullet, SUDA allows USDA's Rural Utility Service to offer qualified entities critical financial assistance. Uh, that includes low interest rates on utility loans and waiving of matching requirements. SUDA should be amended to allow the secretary to exercise uh, SUDA authority across all rural development programs, and that would aid tribal access to rural development programs. The next bullet addresses the community facilities program, which provides affordable funding to develop essential community facilities in rural areas. Presently, tribes are eligible for the facilities fund, but they have to compete with nonprofits and public entities. Establishing a tribal set aside would increase tribal access to this critical fund. And this was mentioned earlier in regards to the third bullet, but essential to tribal development and fulfillment of the trust and treaty responsibility is supporting the federal tribal infrastructure and economic opportunities within federal contracting. Indian employment preference within USDA would support this goal, as would extension of the Buy Indian Act, uh, which presently authorizes Department of Interior to purchase products and services from qualified Native American vendors. Next slide, please. Regarding the next bullet, presently some tribes that have subsidiary local tribal government, such as chapters or districts, would like these instrumentalities to be eligible for USDA programs, uh, basically to the same extent as local governments. And then a similar effort applies for tribally owned corporations. Uh, the effort is to enable them to access USDA business programs. And because uh, the second two bullets are fairly self-explanatory, I won't go into further detail on them. Next slide, please. Brings us to forestry. Uh, on the first bullet, the ask is to make permanent the extension of tribal self-governance and 638 authority that was uh, discussed earlier for the management of forest service and Bureau of land management lands that are adjacent to Indian lands under the tribal Forest Protection Act. Additionally, the ask here um, is to support tribal participation in early planning efforts to integrate tribal management priorities in, in Forest Service's five-year work plans. And the second bullet uh, is in regard to the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, the authority to enter good neighbor agreements was extended to tribes and counties, which was great. DNA authority enables tribes to enter into cooperative agreements with the Forest Service and to perform forest restoration and management activities. The 2018 Farm Bill, however, didn't permit tribes to reinvest those receipts that were generated for forest restoration, and that essentially creates a disincentive to uh, enter um, GNA cooperative agreements. So right now, efforts are underway to correct this issue uh, via legislation that's pending in the 116th Congress and that will likely be reintroduced in the 117th Congress, but also within the next Farm Bill, uh, basically ensuring that, um, that tribes are able to um, retain the receipts uh, for GNA activities and also to extend GNA agreements um, for work performed off forest service lands, essentially where they're connected to the same landscape and watershed. Next slide, please. Education uh, is critical. Um, education provisions are critical within the next Farm Bill. Um, and while these education provisions are also fairly self-explanatory, they broadly involve the need to invest and build the infrastructure of 1994 tribal colleges and universities and also the broadband infrastructure in rural Indian country, uh, including for telemedicine. This year, uh, we especially saw that long-term investments and resources are needed to build uh, tribal IT systems to provide adequate internet connectivity uh, to enable our students to have access to 
a 21st century education, our colleges and universities to perform research um, and also a critical for the delivery of tribal health care. Next slide, please. And I know I'm running close on time, so I'm just gonna highlight the first two provisions um, within nutrition and food sovereignty. Uh, regarding the first bullet, again, as previously mentioned, uh, this is a carryover from the 2018 Farm Bill efforts, and it remains a top priority uh, to enable tribes um, to uh, basically to extend uh, self-determination authority to the SNAP program. Um, over 24% of tribal households access SNAP benefits, so it's critical uh, for tribes to be able to exercise 638 authority for SNAP. And regarding the second bullet, uh, in the next Farm Bill, we would like to make permanent the extension of 638 authority to FDIPR um, and also to continue to enhance that authority and of course to actually get the 2018 authority appropriately implemented. And so on that, I will turn it back to you, Colby. Oh, thank you, Dr. I am um, all. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. I have questions if the panel is ready. Um, we do have some great questions in here, so I'd like to get to that. So get some answers for you. Um, the first I'd like to mention, Anita, yes, Ashley did drop a link to a copy of this report. It's in the chat right now. Um, but the first question is from Joseph. He said, what, and it's to all panelists, what has been the lobbying effort from your perspective Organization of organizations to the Biden administration on appointing native reps in the USDA and DOI to continue achieving the policy objectives from the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, I'll go ahead and go first. And we have done no lobbying for our federal friends that may be listening in that regard. However, when asked if we have any recommendations, we do come forward with those recommendations. The IAC isn't positioned as NCAI is where we can actually engage in lobbying by the strict definition, but we try to try to inspire discussions that ask for solutions so that we can offer them. Uh, to that end, we have made several suggestions as to folks that we have run across in the course of doing our work that we think could bring their capacity for solving problems to the department and to the Department of Interior. So we're, we're actively engaging in that, those type of conversations as we speak. We have been asked to convene a tribal producer meeting with the transition team, and we just wrapped that up today and had some really great dialogue that we think is going to lead to a very well-reasoned handoff of some solutions to the Biden-Harris administration when that handoff comes from the transition team. Sure, and I'll, I'll follow up on Director Bichonneau's um, comments. Uh, NCAI recently passed a resolution, which I'm going to drop into the chat box that calls for the appointment, the nomination of a Native American uh, for Interior Secretary. And while that resolution is focused on Interior, we do broadly support uh, Native American appointments throughout the administration. Um, Native Americans are key to building that federal tribal infrastructure that we all talked about um, and the ability to implement the Farm Bill uh, and pretty much any uh, tribal agriculture related legislation. Um, in regards to transition engagement, um, similar to our partners, we're working to amplify tribal needs in different areas. So actually at 4 p.m. Eastern today, uh, many of the folks who are on this call uh, will be attending a call with the USDA uh, Forest Service rep, rep for uh, the Biden transition team, Andrea Delgado, and she's meeting with tribal leaders to hear directly from tribal leaders on their forestry priorities for the next administration. And so our goal is really to amplify um, the voices of tribal leaders uh, in regards to USDA's um, many different uh, departments.
Aaron or Colby, I just wanted to give you an opportunity before I jump to the next question. Um, I would just note, uh, thank you, Marlene. I would just note, as, as Zach did, for IFAI at a public institution, we can't lobby. Um, but as the research partner to the Native Pharma Coalition, like we, we certainly can do explore administrative options for USTA to be able to staff up more with Native folks. And you can do that with position descriptions, for example, within USDA. And so that's certainly something that's on our radar as a research partner. All right, I will move to the next question. It's for Aaron. Large tribes are at a disadvantage with the small $3 million allocation. Do you anticipate that there will be additional funds authorized for this in the future? And do you anticipate that it will be feasible for large tribes to be able to participate in the demonstration project? Thank you for that. I, was, I saw that come through the chat and I think that's from Ashley. Hey, Ashley, it's, it's good to hear from you. Um, have it seen you since February? <laughs> it feels like a million years ago. Um, I know that that three million dollars. Uh, we knew when it was when it was appropriated that it wasn't going to go very far for everybody in this demonstration project. And I know, especially for large tribes in Fidipper, um, three million may not even cover your entire budget for fresh fruits and vegetables, for example, for the whole year. Um, so we know that that we know that's a challenge for large tribes. Um, I would say pressure on USDA to get the funds spent out quickly is probably the best way to ensure that we see future larger appropriations here. I know there's a lot of interest um, across Indian country in participating in this, and I think the more applications USDA sees, um, the better opportunities there will be to see additional, um, additional funding come through. The Farm Bill authorizes it at 5 million. I know that's still a small number, especially for large tribes like Cherokee Nation or Navajo Nation who have many different ITOs that are running many different fit up or sites and serve 100,000 uh, people potentially between them. Um, so I think um, that really just, just focusing on getting those applications in is gonna be the best way to drive more investment um, in that program. And I think that's par partly why you see, if you look in the brief, uh, making this opportunity not only permanent, but also expanding it entirely to fit up or as a whole and not just for procurement is gonna be really important. I think it's important to have a little conversation about the institutional purchasing that we do control in Indian country. There are many tribes that are doing self-governance compacts and self-determination contracts with their schools and with their Indian health service facilities. <clears throat> You're in control of the purchases there too. Buy that food. It's federal money that you have control of where you can buy that food yourselves. Um, I just want to piggyback off of that for Aaron. Um, you mentioned getting the applications out there. Uh, what barriers do you see um, that tribes are not, is it a technical assistance issue um, in, in getting more of those applications in? Well, the big barrier right now is definitely that USDA hasn't opened the door yet. Um, we are waiting on USDA. And as soon as USDA does that, um, you know, what, one of the things we're working on at IFAI is sort of a technical resource and assistance guide for tribes and ITOs that want to apply. Um, we are, we're waiting to deploy that until we see the, the door open at USDA and make sure that whatever we send out comports entirely with their final criteria. I do think that what was released in October will likely look pretty much exactly like the final copy, fingers crossed, because I think it really was very responsive to Indian country's requests to USDA. Um, but that's the biggest barrier is just waiting on USDA. So um, as people are you know, having conversations and identifying priorities, like, that's why that's such a big one administratively because that is entirely in USDA's hands. Right. Uh, Leon asks to all panelists, um, how does a tribe nominate a person to the proposed TAC and who will select the members? I'm, I'm glad to take that one. Um, so the devil's in the details about how I kind of be able to get nominated. It needs to be implemented first. Um, regarding who, uh, who's that? So there are appointments that will occur from the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, they will make those appointments for some of those. Uh, 
There's also congressional appointments as well too. So both the, the chairs and ranking members of the House Agriculture Committee, uh, Senate Agriculture Committee, Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, uh, each get to appoint people to it as well too. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I made a gloss over, it's structured just like the Tribal Treasury Advisory Committee as well too. So it has the both joint congressional uh, and uh, administrative appointments uh, to it as well. So, you know, uh, typically how those go is they, I mean, depending on who is chair or ranking of the committees, they sometimes look for representatives from within their states um, as well, or neighboring states to be part of that. Um, the USDA ones, the USDA will probably have to come up with its own process for how to go about doing that as well. But so the, hopefully we'll, hopefully it'll get implemented and then we'll be able to get into the how people can get appointed uh, to that to advise the secretary on it. Um, I have some breaking news here. So I wanna actually toss it over to Dr. Ian Rutgers. Go ahead, Ian, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining the webinar and, and great conversation so far. I just wanted to take a second to uh, share with you some news. Politico is reporting that Joe Biden will be nominating Bob Holland for Secretary of Interior. That is great news. That's uh, definitely something that we need, a big win. And then hopefully Janie <laughs> will follow. Um, I do have one more question for you all. This is from Ted. He says, hi friends, nice job. I appreciate the recommendation that Indian preference be extended to hiring at USDA. Until that happens, what can USDA agencies do to better recruit and hire native people? It's a great question. I'll go ahead and weigh in here because we've had some experience with that. The IAC in partnership with IFAI and others have had a professional development initiative that's ongoing for 10, 12, 15 years. Oftentimes we get our youth as they're engaging in their higher educational endeavors right to the precipice of participating in USDA pathways programs or that type of deal. And then the wheels come off because USDA doesn't decide on those positions until March. And the high achieving students that, that we have the opportunity to work with have their plans for the summer made way before March. So more local control, more local authority with regard to these intern positions and staffing positions would be a great starting point. Also looking for recommendations when those positions come open. Having, having the IAC, NCAI, First Nations, IFAI, IFAI, Indian Land Tenure Foundation serve as the sounding board or the, the uh, job listing service, if you will. We've got a lot of great talent out here in Indian country and we've got to find a way to get them into those positions where they can help move that policy and bring their knowledge about their community to that program. Yeah, and I think those are those are amazing suggestions. And I would just piggyback off of what Zach said and add um, definitely see us as a, a communications partner when there are job listings that go out. We would love to help spread those around to make sure they're getting in front of folks in Indian country who are excited about taking on those kind of opportunities. Second thing is, and I'm gonna give a shout out to the previous Biltech administration and the specifically the Office of Tribal Relations as it was led at the time by founding uh, director of OTR, Janie Hip, and some of her staff, including Tony Stanger McLaughlin, who did a lot of work on how USDA can restructure position descriptions to actually make sure that you are hiring native people for roles, especially when they are serving Indian country. Um, USDA can structure position descriptions by requiring things like a certain amount of experience working directly with tribal leaders, working directly with tribes. Those are things you can do administratively within the boundaries of the law to make sure that you are hiring need more native people in the department.
We have one comment slash question for Bryce <laughs> in the woods. I love your name. Is there any discussion on regenerative soil? Hey, Cola, how you doing? I've got an answer for you. We've got a significant emphasis on how do we empower producers, community members to really take an active part in building soil health, doing regenerative soil practices. And until we address the underlying issue of the inability to access finance, which I know you're personally challenged with, with your community organization, access finance that allows those soil regeneration practices, we're gonna to continue to struggle. So we've got an initiative that we are trying to advocate for within farm bill discussions, but also through philanthropy and other in, or institutional uh, investors to help towards that end. Good question, my friend. And Zach, while we have you, I just wonder if you could give an update on the next steps for the Farm Bowl Coalition and how uh, tribes can get involved if they're already not involved. Absolutely. As I mentioned before, we were able to secure some funding for an advocacy effort for the next three years and bring the Native Farm Bill Coalition under the auspices, if you will, of the IAC. We're going to continue to work with all of our national partners on that, but we will be engaging in our normal regional events, our normal national events, and solicit that input there. We've also got a network of technical assistance specialists within the IAC where we can have those on the ground discussions about what's working and what's not. We'll continue to work with our federal partners on finding ways to make changes in the interim, but uh, we just held our annual membership meeting last year or last week rather and did it in a virtual format where where members could submit caucus issues virtually as we hopefully transition to more normalcy for next fall where we can do our conferences in person we're going to roll out that virtual input capacity through our regional events over the coming year and we would be able to get issues highlight issues do some analysis on what the actual policy is, whether it's a simple regulatory change, simple regulatory change, that's an oxymoron probably, or whether it needs to be a statutory change in the farm bill itself. That's our, that'll be our process. And we'll of course inter interface with our partners at NCAI to, to maintain that voice and that relationship in DC so that when our tribal leaders do have the ability to get to town, we can make sure that they've got the right meetings aligned so that they can bring those issues directly to the policymakers themselves. Zach, um, I think Bryce wants to, uh, Bryce in the woods, I love that, wants to elaborate um, and you can go ahead and speak you want to celebrate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You know, this regenerative soil, uh, it's, it's got a, it's got a lot of indigenous, uh, concepts and, uh, we got like 1.2 million acres and we have a, we have a kind of a practice going on with range units and farm pasture, but also the treaty applies you know and and it seems like we're practicing something now during a day of pandemic global pandemics where food is going to be critical and food sovereignty for indigenous people is, is paramount you know so i believe this uh, we're going to push for this regenerative practice on tribal lands and reintroducing the buffalo and there's motions and actions by council here on, on Shine River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota that all this would fall in place, you know, where you strengthen the families and the communities, but mainly is to, is to create that soil by not overgrazing or overstocking those tribal lands with uh, livestock. 
which is a practice, which is uh, very detrimental to the medicines and the watersheds and everything. So it's a whole new uh, old paradigm shift back to when the buffalo were roaming free and we were roaming with them. They made the highways that we followed. So it's going back to a practice that's all the states, I believe, and it's kind of a movement with FSA and NRCS. NRCS is calling it a pond initiative, but you can see uh, digging a dam and uh, you know having water per cause, but you can see uh, making a pond and making it so diverse that the frogs and fish and everything that's uh, natural to that pond is regenerative. It's really what natural law is all about. So uh, I see this movement that really needs to catch on on, on all the all these reservation tribal lands that we need to push for that under uh, food sovereignty and see if any tribes are at that level because now you have hemp and you have uh, going through the Senate and the Moors Act. So you actually have a, a plant that's real diverse that could actually look at some economy being developed. But mm. North Dakota is way ahead of South Dakota in, in uh, hemp, but now you have the other diversity, possibly some economic, social economic changes for the tribes, but it all boils back to the Makocha, to the land and how that land is being treated or abused or misused. We're not white people, you know, and, and uh, the white cattleman, he, uh, he thinks about battling that cow and taking it to market and uh, making money, you know, and that's his uh, concept of uh, being a livestock man. And uh, that's not Lakota or an indigenous. And that's what those practices are happening on tribal lands, which is very detrimental. And so we're putting a team together yeah. with biologists oh. and, and other tribes could uh, kick in on this, you know, uh, that we could really look at this regenerative soil and let's, instead of hearing talking heads, you know, that we really actually do it. It's critical now more than ever. Thank well, you. Yes, I want to thank you for that. It is important to keep those uh, traditional practices in mind uh, when we have these discussions. Um, as we're winding down on time, I want to give the panelists um, an opportunity for any final parting shots that you would like to, um, that maybe you have missed during your presentation that you would like to mention. I'll start with Colby. For sure. Thank you, Marlene. I, I think the, you know, as we're, um, you know, looking at, you know, potential action in Congress to do something, maybe something more uncertainty with that. Um, I mean, um, you know, the focus on administrative actions as we talked about it is really essential. I mean, that's some of the stuff that we've really seen through this is we've seen where sometimes the response hasn't worked the way it's supposed to, to help provide support, not only to, for food assistance, but for producers as well too. But we've also seen some incredible success stories of what's been able to happen. And those have been driven by practices and resiliency that's occurred on the ground. So when we're looking at all the different solutions that are occurring, in the next 48 hours to the next, you know, 48 weeks, um, you know, we really need to look at what all the different policies are that helps build and support that resiliency and investments into tribal food systems and tribal food producers. So as we're kind of talking about all of this, that's kind of just an umbrella idea of what we need to be thinking about, uh, I think, going forward. Thank you, Colby. I'll pass it over to Aaron. Sure, thank you, Marlene. Um, I mean, I would definitely echo everything that Colby said and probably just um, expand on that a bit and say um, the dialogue in government to government consultation that the USDA has been able to have with tribal leaders on FDIPR in particular has been a huge driver for change and positive change for Indian country in that program over the last several years. And I would love to see a USDA that wants to look at how they can institutionalize that kind of meaningful, timely dialogue with tribal leadership um, across all of the 29 USDA agencies. I think that dialogue is so essential. Um, that's an administrative action that USDA doesn't, they already have a mandate to do it as a, as a federal agency, they, to honor that responsibility, to honor their trust responsibility and have that government to government dialogue with tribal nations, just so, so critical. 
in rolling these programs out in a good way and making sure that things are implemented in a way that makes sense um, for Indian country and opens them up to all the opportunities that we've been talking about here today, whether that's better, uh, more culturally appropriate food, whether it's a market channel opportunity and economic empowerment for native producers. I really feel like that dialogue is so pivotal and paramount. So I, I would love to see more of that going forward. Could not agree more. Thank you, Erin. Fatima? Sure, and I will definitely echo Erin and Colby's comments. Um, I would just add that I think within the 117th Congress, ag and rural development is going to be the source of a lot of opportunities for bipartisanship. Uh, we've already seen it this year, whether it's on wildfires uh, with discussions and agreements about prescribed fire, uh, even within climate change and resource management, there's a lot of commonality. So I think uh, as we're going to be discussing the 2023 Farm Bill, it, I would say it's critical for us all to also think what can we um, move forward in the next Congress, uh, whether it's part of a COVID package or any other package that comes together, maybe another well, infrastructure is definitely on the table, but um, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And then administratively, similar to what Colby and um, Aaron mentioned, the Biden uh, the Biden team's priorities for the Build Back Better uh, framework is COVID-19, economic recovery, climate change and equity, and tribal agricultural development and rural economies are critical to all of those items, whether we're looking at climate change or economic recovery, building basically the base of America um, is critical to all of that. So I think we're going to see a lot of exciting opportunities within the administration um, and within Congress. And going to Director uh, Yushino's earlier comment, I think connecting um, tribal advocates, leaders, community members to those opportunities to advocate for these broad goals, I think will be uh, critical for a lot of the organizations. Zach, certainly not least. Do you have anything that you would like to add? Uh, yeah, there is. I, you know, I would just like to encourage everybody to stay involved and stay engaged. I know in times, especially like this, when we're in the midst of a going on nine month crisis, it's hard to think about where your food comes from and how is that important in the grand scheme of things. So we've got to stay active. We've got to stay engaged. Use the organizations that you've got at your disposal. I dropped in the chat box there the link to our latest edition of our success stories. Our contact information is in there and we are at your service. My phone number is 605-222-3852 and that thing is always with me. My email is zach at indianag.org. And we've got staff that have devoted their professional life to helping you with whatever your agriculture and food system needs are. Let us put them in the same place as you and help you with whatever you've got. Stay active, keep advocating, and keep doing the work that we need in Indian country. Thank you, Zach. Um, I could not agree more. And uh, I would be remiss if I did not thank you and Colby um, for your tireless efforts. And this brief was only possible through the work of the partners. Um, and I just want to reiterate that this is a living and breathing document. We are still in the midst of this pandemic. So things are going to change. The landscape as, as, as it's going to change. So we just want to put that out there. We will periodically update the document. Ashley went ahead and um, dropped in the chat for anyone that didn't see it earlier. But I do want to get it out there that thank you to the Intertribe Ag Council, IFAI. Congrats again, Erin. Um, First Nations Development Institute has been instrumental as well as Cody and Jim at Intertribal uh, Timber Council. I'm sure I'll be talking to them later. Uh, and Patrice and Carrie at American Indian Higher Ed, and I'm Jake Schellinger. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting people, but I just wanted to get that out there that um, this is uh, 
a work, a, a love, a labor of love for all of us. And I thank your tireless dedication and the countless hours that you've spent to this. There is our contact information, um, as Zach indicated. Um, stay tuned. As I mentioned earlier, on the 14th of January, after the new year, we're going to be rolling out our resource directory that will hope, you know, hopefully advance this movement even further. So I uh, and do please do connect with us if you want to sign up for our listserv, join food sovereignty at ncai.org. Um, and please, everyone, stay safe and healthy through the holiday season. And we will talk to you soon. Thank you.